Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you to Franchise CXO Dialogue. The series involves learning from thought leaders at leading franchise organizations. Hope you all are keeping safe and healthy. My name is Ashita Marya, and I'm the CEO of Franchise India. During this conversation, all our attendees can post their questions in Q&A section, and we'll try to answer all of them. Uh, today, I'm very excited to welcome uh, Mr. YVS Vijay Kumar, the CEO for Mahindra First Choice Services, and IAM Ahmedabad alumni has been with automobile industry giants like Maruti, HM Mitsubishi, Gabriel, and Behar India in last 25 years. During his last nine years with Mahindra First Choice Services, Mr. Kumar has been instrumental in successfully building the company from ground up. Uh, with specific emphasis on bringing transparency to the industry through a brick and click model. Under his leadership, Mahindra First Choice Services has emerged as one of the fastest growing companies in Mahindra Group. Mahindra First Choice Services is a part of $20.7 billion Mahindra Group and is India's largest chain of multi-brand car workshops uh, with over 400 workshops present in 366 cities. It has been uh, growing its network of two-wheeler multi-brand services with about 200 workshops. The company serviced over 5 lakh vehicles last year and has an aim to establish a countrywide network of over 1,000 workshops. The company offers private label spare parts for all brands of cars under the Mahindra First Choice brand name. And we have with us Mr. Gaurav Marya, an entrepreneur, an author, and an absolute authority on franchising. Um, uh, Mr. Kumar, I would, uh, you know, like to uh, start with you with a very obvious question of how has uh, COVID-19 changed the consumer expectation from Hindra First Choice Services? Okay, first of all, uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you for uh, having me here. Uh, and I hope everyone is uh, you know, safe and sound in these tough times. Yeah, the COVID-19 actually has um, thrown things out of gear for several industries, including ours, for the past three uh, months. You know, at least two months we were completely shut. And uh, obviously, uh, our franchise community has been having a tough time and have been having a lot of doubts also on the current situation and the future as well. So the way we have handled the situation is you know, in three ways. One is, how do we ensure that we are protecting our stakeholders, the immediate customer that is our franchisees. Uh, we have about 500 franchisees across the country, 300 for four wheelers and 200 for two wheeler. How do we protect them and ensure that, uh, you know, uh, their spirits are kept up and secondly, how do we ensure that our customers are also kind of protected during this particular period? Because as you know, uh, the lockdown was suddenly announced and a lot of vehicles were actually lying at our workshops and which were under repair, which could not be completed because of this lockdown situation. That is one part. Second part is how do we ensure that we um, kind of you know, restore the situation? How do we, when we reopen, how do we handle the situation in such a way that we are giving certain reassurance to our consumers that their cars are well protected, good hygiene is maintained, and we're also ensuring that contactless service is kind of assured for them so that you know the, the, the risk of contacting any problem is less. And third thing is that once we open up completely across the country, how do we reinvent ourselves, how do we reboot ourselves so that we give the experience that consumers want in the post COVID-19 scenario. There are three, four things that we are observing which have changed in the, due to COVID-19, which are quite obvious. One is of course, customers want less and less uh, contact. Earlier, people used to actually prefer coming to the workshops and getting them serviced. We used to do a lot of pick and drop also, but it used to be restricted about 15 to 20%, maybe 30 to 40% in metro cities, but much less in smaller cities. But I think today, a lot of people will be opting for pick and drop service. One big change. We need to be prepared for that. Second thing is, um, people would rather have the vehicle service at their doorstep, if it is possible, if the surroundings are amenable to that, 
if the you know, for example they are living in a big society the society is uh, willing to give the space and time and you know uh, uh, facilities for that that also will be probably be preferred by the consumers and third thing in terms of consumer behavior which we are seeing is a change i'm not very sure it is still too early to say that um, probably it's my personal opinion as well that to certain extent you know people will be preferring to do service themselves in this last 2 to 3 months we all have experienced you know uh, things that we would would have done easily outside we were trying to do it ourselves starting from household chores things like haircut you know a lot of my friends got their hair cut by their spouses and they were not very happy about it they were okay with it you know so that kind of thing and car getting bra- uh, broken down is this is a big issue so people would be willing to do a little bit of servicing of the car themselves like periodic maintenance simple you know filter change or simple breakdown maintenance those kind of things also will be there so these these are the consumer behavioral changes that we are expecting and on the franchise front and also it will probably get extended to other other partners or our suppliers and vendors there also we are seeing a lot of uh, you know tendency towards uh, containment of working capital you know funds flow cash flow is going to be a big issue in the last two months actually people struggled to pay salaries right to uh, uh, purchase spare parts after opening up because even in the market people are saying the credit is a thing of past and no credit will be further provided to these people so how do we ensure that can we give a solution to our franchises and our vendors in terms of working capital of course government is trying to do something for msmes but how can we actually add value to them either expedite the process or provide some solution if not direct funds to these people that is one way and second thing is they also would like to have some sort of support from us so what we did during this lockdown period we extended complete fee waiver we knew very clearly that they were not working there's no point in actually charging monthly royalty fees so we waived it off completely and on top of that we also set up a fund to help some of the employees who were either stuck or you know a lot of people were out of jobs especially the, the contract labor and people would not did not have enough savings to sustain them through the stuff period so there we actually you know uh, 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 dollar some cash payments in some cases provided ration and provided transport fee of course to those people to reach their uh, places so this kind of support also was given to ensure that there is a a, a, a brand or the, the, the franchisor who is willing to take care of the the franchises as such but th- that is during this period but post once we open up completely you know they will also be looking at the new ways of doing business how do we ensure that we are adjusting to the new reality the new normal and you know thrive and prosper in that new environment this is the area where you know a lot of uh, new habits will have to be taken into consideration for example working from home high levels of digitization uh, those things have to be incorporated into our processes into our interactions with the customers as well so that also will be Uh, looked into in a major way this is how overall we are trying to see how do we you know uh, uh, handle the current situation sure sure so well, that's very interesting and i think you know this is a very valuable you know especially the, the do it yourself maintenance i think is a is can be really a new new sense uh, which is uh, uh, especially in automobile i think uh, this can be a, a some early trend i mean i think uh, very valuable on that side So what do you ask? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Goro. In fact, I just like to uh, expand a little bit on that. Even before COVID nineteen, for the past two years, we have been running a program called. There are two names. Initially, we started with "Get Dirty with Your Car." Wow. And then we said, okay, let us make it, you know, a little more appealing. Like, uh, go on a date with your car. The basic idea is to invite the customer along with their car to one of our workshops on a Sunday, right? and actually go through the experience of not a major repair but doing periodic maintenance of your car a lot of people actually turned up and um they actually enjoyed the experience 
tremendously. So they got to know about their car and they were became more comfortable around their car. And they all like this idea that I, I, I know I have the confidence now that there is a small breakdown. I can take care of it myself instead of looking around for major help. So that kind of programs will probably find more resonance. Of course, we need to take care of the, the social distancing issue in a little more uh, elaborate manner now, but it could be the trend in the future. No, no, it is. It is. I think I take your point and this is going to be a big trend in future. I have my own personal experience. I broke my car in terms of uh, one of these days in lockdown and, and my battery was because I was not using that car and went out and I didn't have any idea what to do, you know. So, <laughs> so I just parked it there and came back walking back home. So, so it is, uh, so it is, it's, it's a good for everybody to know what they're driving and how, and they obviously cannot indulge beyond a point because we need a special are doing it, but a general maintenance or a regular periodical check, I think would make a lot of sense. Over to you, Ash. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. So going on a date with your car uh, certainly sounds exciting. And uh, so, you know, uh, we understand that you've got so many partners and, uh, you know, you yourself have been involved in this uh, concept for about nine years now. So how um, has uh, you experienced, you know, in your, in your own way, if you could let us know how a relationship uh, is something that evolves according to you as, you know, an entrepreneur uh, who's a franchisee is also, you know, somebody who has that uh, ownership mindset and he runs his own company. And, uh, you know, uh, your group also is somebody who's, who's managing their own group and they're sharing their brand name with those entrepreneurs. How do you maintain that, uh, you know, relationship or an equation uh, with them? Okay. Um, <clears throat> just to give you clarity, uh, we've been there for the past nine years, but the franchising has uh, been started about uh, five, six years back. Right. Um, the first and foremost uh, thing with the franchise is, is that the franchise the value proposition has to be extremely strong. You know, there is a perceived value proposition and there is also a tangible value proposition. Both the components have to be extremely strong for the relationship to be good. Finally, a, a franchisee is a budding entrepreneur who wants to have his own thriving business and he has to succeed in that business. Then obviously he will have lots of uh, respect towards the franchise and the brand. So that's what we focused on. When we started six years back, we focused a lot on uh, getting the guy without any experience, either in a business, running a business or even automotive industry to become an expert in running this workshop within a period of three to six months. That means we invested a lot in time in terms of hand holding before the commercial operation start. That means the setup process itself is quite long I and mean, it takes about nine to 12 months for a uh, four-wheeler franchise to set up and for two-wheeler it is about two to three months it's almost like setting up a factory with a lot, lot of license and other things have to be taken for this so that is where we uh, help them in terms of layout in some in terms of you know uh, design in terms of procuring uh, material in terms of even uh, you know applying for licenses on time and what kind of uh, things have to be done before. We have a specific program called ASBM, Auto Service Business Management, where immediately after issuing LOI, we invite these uh, franchise uh, uh, prospects to our Nasik uh, Mahindra Institute of Quality. And there we teach them about the fundamentals of automotive business, fundamentals of franchising business. How do we, how to actually ensure that customers are acquired and how do we ensure that they are satisfied and they are retained all those things and how do we run the operations? How do we manage the human resource element, which is extremely important, you know, to have a satisfied customer, you need to have very satisfied employees also. So all those things will be taught in a thorough manner in about six days time, a complete weeks program. It has been hugely successful and all these franchise owners, they first of all understand the criticality or the complexity of this business, which will give them a feeling whether to continue with this or not, you know? Though in our case, the dropouts after attending the business is less than 5%, but it is easy to identify those guys who may not be willing to take up so much of pains early on rather than having a journey with them and then you know, finding out later. So that is one thing. And secondly, after he starts the business, in the first six months, 
with a lot of hand holding in terms of how to conduct business development activities customer acquisition activities like service uh, uh, you know uh, workshops and all those things and once he becomes expert we also of course during this time we are also uh, uh, giving a huge support in terms of spare parts supply as well so first two three years in fact in our experience it has been very good people were highly appreciative of how we were doing this business with them and providing maximum support but later on then we quickly realized that as a continuing business now he has understood how to run the business the value proposition has to be slightly different how do we sustainable sustain the value proposition after he understands how to run the business that is the second aspect that is where the aspects of the customer acquisition on a continuous basis the the understanding the pain points for example we are able to provide customer strain we are able to provide lots of tires to insurance companies but he gets into a working capital problem pretty quickly he takes lots of credit from the outside though we supply more than 50 60% of his requirement of spare parts he gets into a credit uh, you know a vicious cycle how do we get him out of those things? that that is where also we have developed lots of products like we have tie up with certain banks and that is what is helping us giving them uh, uh, adequate working capital at the right time and also we have a product called a mask which is you know the insurance company tie up wherein we give spare parts on credit to the franchisee but the payment is actually routed through us uh so that you know franchise owners actual involvement in funds management the workshop will be very very minimal so these are the kind of very high level of supports at the early stage before the start of operations after the start of operations and once it becomes a steady state and how do we grow the business along with it or at all the three stages we have actually developed a very strong value proposition that is one thing second in terms of actual relationships also um we have a very strong field force with proper hierarchy to ensure that uh, there is actual contact once in a week at least a franchise business manager visits the workshop does a general audit of the place sees to it that the processes are managed well and also checks whether the customer satisfaction is up to the level if there are any pending cases those things and he also addresses all the problems that he is facing so that way we actually maintain good relations and of course once in quarter we conduct certain franchise interaction meetings and once in a year we also have annual uh, uh, you know uh, uh, retreats with the franchisees so that we give some rewards and recognition also with them so that is how we try to manage the whole thing in a comprehensive manner now this is very helpful and i think a lot of uh, uh, you know early stage brands which are now looking at your this is followed by a lot of young franchise brands uh should really learn from what you implemented i think you one of the finest uh, companies which have implemented a strong program which we call three stages of a, a franchise hand holding what we call the dependent stage which is a little more when a little bit uh, go to market kind of capability training getting them started a project support getting this outlet ready and so on which is very dependent stage you know most of the times uh it, this is a stage where i think the relationship really breaks uh or relationship becomes uh, uh weaker so to say and you cannot fill that you know this dependent stage is anything from 3 months to 6 months where the franchise is absolutely dependent on you and then you come down to what i call interdependent stage which you mean your smooth functioning your supply chain your other issues you know uh, your manpower training issues a lot of smaller uh, issues which looks like the franchisee lose that i i lose a sale or i lose sale because of this and so on so forth so it at that stage if you are able to handhold and then becomes the third stage which is independent stage where you implement what we call the err uh yeah courage, recognize and reward so yeah, yeah. very few companies i have seen i should compliment you and uh, at uh, at a group level you have a lot of uh, value system which is looking after the the partner and i think particularly in the service which is very difficult because i know sometimes in service business is easier said than actually implemented uh to implement a program like this uh, and i can tell you with with honestly only but 5% of uh, top companies in india which have that a full training program uh, which we very very critical and most of the uh, global successful organizations would have a very strong uh, training program which is 6 to 10 days kind of a program so i should uh, really compliment uh, 
your your effort on that because it's a especially when you are training operators uh, because in your business you need operators people who are involved in their business uh, this is not a so to say a passive investment where you just put money and and run a business of service service needs demanding uh, yeah absolutely the most successful franchises are the guys who are actively involved in the business themselves yeah and 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 uh, you know talking about hand holding and all that it is very similar to raising a child that you conceive and then carry him for 9 months that is pre birth that time also you need to you know take lot of care and once a child is born in the early stages is heavily dependent on you so you have to take care of him through the teen years educate him well and then when he is now independent then also you have to maintain very strong relationship so that he actually achieves you know lot in in, in the business in life absolutely absolutely over to you yeah that's interesting so you know there are a couple of questions uh, i thought i'll ask you you know right in between uh, them is uh, is mahindra first choice services open for conversion franchising or do they already do it this uh, is question you know because uh, the business in in the service space and i just elaborate the this question you know one side you have oems and oems uh, are expensive uh, and uh, and after some time you don't want to take especially when you are uh, you know and level vehicles you don't want to take back to the oems and and uh, and then you have these independent uh you know uh, which are mom and pop kind of uh, operation which lack service quality standardization today's technology spare part spare part is a very big problem for them because it's genuine spare parts here they don't get and uh, and still the percentage of this branded trusted uh, third party uh, uh, service providers is only 3 to 4% why it is so why would we not convert this very large 97% uh, here i mean i think oem let's forget about oem because they they are they would be excited for the first two years when you have warranties running but after that after market why would that 97 not convert what, what is the what is the missing point here and where do you see this happening yeah see when we entered the arena we also thought that converting the unorganized guys into an organized setup like ours where we'll be providing lots of support and lots of assurance will be quite fast but it has taken its time the main reason as per us is that you know uh the business has been very well established for very long right all these uh independent garages has been doing business in a certain way for very very long so initially when we started this business 6 years back we did attract a few garages but uh within a period of 1 to 1 and 1/2 years we realized that they were set in their ways they were not willing to either change their process enter everything into the system right and um you know follow even the software that we provide which is kind of a requirement basic requirement from us so that is that is why the the relationship could not go very very long and also we realized that the, see what are the value proposition that we are providing in a major way one is the spare parts spare parts is a major value proposition and second is of course the customer acquisition uh insurance companies as well as retail customer acquisition typically the problem that we as an industry as an organized service industry faced was that when we started off we did not have any natural advantage with us right we did not have scale to start with so when we start off at the low level compared to a, a oem dealer our infrastructure has to match with those of a dealer rather than that of a road side grass so initial costs would be high and spare parts you need to procure at a local level only initially costs of the spare parts also would be high and and all in fact we'll be procuring and supplying so there will be additional administrative costs and thirdly the, we need to actually spend on marketing to attract these guys to the, uh, the, the the workshops so that also is an additional cost compared to a dealer so in terms of competitiveness there was no you know the 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 ecosystem was not really geared towards organized service chain at that particular time so then we started realizing one thing that let us segment the customer into three one is the guy who is highly quality conscious okay first two three years anyway everybody goes to 
uh, OE dealer because warranty is free and the visit frequency is also low. Ticket size is also relatively low. As it keeps going up, they would like to look at other alternatives. Then on the other hand, other end, we have highly cost conscious guys who are like fleet operators, you know, or cars which are pretty old, seven or eight years old, then we would just like to maintain the car. We don't want to spend more money on that. But in between, there's a huge segment which wants, you know, a quality service, but at a competitive rates. So that is where we actually entered. And when we made that switch, uh, we were quite successful in C and D class cities, highly successful, because we could actually fill the large gap that existed in terms of supply chain, spare parts, and also the customer acquisition, because single brand did not have enough volumes, but a multi-brand, all brands put together, they were good volumes. The third factor was also that the real estate costs and the cost of running of this thing was relatively low. And the change, the difference in spare parts and labor rates not very high between a metro and there, correct? So the prohibitive costs in metros made it very difficult to get into new parts. So in metros, now we have changed our business plan. And also let me tell you our personal experience that initially when I told you, the kind of support that we were giving was highly useful in setting up the business and running, uh, understanding how to run the business, experiencing it. So that is all, anyway already existing with the independent garage. They were not valuing that. When we actually started developing the value proposition on a sustainable basis, that is when people have started appreciating us. The three things that we developed. One is very high uh, uh, amount of relationship with the insurance companies. We have tied up all the insurance companies with cashless and also we have tied up with them for customer inflow and also we have tied up with them for working capital management. These things are going to help substantially the independent garages. So if they see sudden spike in their revenue and margins and profits, they would definitely like to come to us, right? And on the other hand, in terms of uh, systems and software also, initially we were using SAP software, even for our franchise workshops. Then we understood and realized that probably it is too uh, 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 difficult to manage, not so user friendly, but also difficult to get people to operate it. And somebody comes and works for three months, his value shoots up and he leaves. Again, he has to recruit somebody else. Again, he has to go through the pain. So we have developed our own internal software for garage management, which is much more user friendly, much more mobile friendly. And for that, you need not actually train a lot as well. So that also has made the adoption much more simplified. So these two factors are now attracting our um, people in metros, all the independent garages to us. And the third uh, and final thing would be that we are launching, we have actually launched already the express version. Right now our four wheeler workshop consists of uh, a standard workshop, everything, including the paint shop, body shop is there and regular maintenance, all kinds of services can be done there. But we also said that this kind of setup requires large, you know, area. Uh, and, and getting that in a metro, in a, in a, in a, in a typical uh, hotspot will be difficult. Whereas we will be focusing on periodic maintenance services with Express model. Express format we have launched recently. It is again gaining good traction. And this is where we will be converting a lot of independent garages as well and expand our footprint in the metro cities as well. So with all this together, the value proposition for independent garage also has become quite attractive and going forward, we will be able to give huge value proposition to them as well. Absolutely, and I personally feel that the consumer also would have a significant shift uh, for moving from where they would not have the trust and the confidence and the independent garage while they've been historically there, and they're conveniently located, but you still lack trust. You really don't know, you still cannot have. And when the brand like Mahindra packing uh, first choice, so I think it brings in a huge amount of trust. And I think this was also largely because through or three OEMs had a big market share. And because they had a big market share, uh, the third party service capability as a branded capability chain never worked because I don't want to name the OEM, but they, they were actually monopolizing a little bit on on aftermarket. Now, as the market shares are rationalizing, a lot of new brands are coming in, new OEMs are coming in, and they would not be able to build their own capabilities to serve everywhere. 
like the historic uh, large uh, automobile brands, uh, they would need to have a big shift. Rather, I see a bigger partnership and I've seen this in consumer durables also. The service market really started where companies stopped making their own service capability and they would come to a third party uh, brand like yours and say, why don't you lead that? Say a, a particular OEM comes in and has only 10 dealerships in India or 20 dealerships in India or 30 dealerships. They would never be able to service 900 cities of India. So they would have to then come to you and say, why don't you take additional responsibility and we authorize you as one of our, our uh, priority uh, service points uh, to service those capability. And I see as the market start opening up and no, more uh, uh, you know, automobile brands entering the market and so on and so forth, they would need this capability. Absolutely, so absolutely. moving into new technologies of servicing, especially electric vehicles and a lot of other technologies. I know at Mahindra, there's a lot of focus going on at a group level on, on the you know, last mile mobility and uh, speciality vehicles and so on and so forth. So are, are, is the service uh, arm of yours is also moving, uh, gearing up those capabilities? Absolutely. We have future ready. But at the same time, we need to attain certain scale to actually uh, invest heavily into those areas. The, the, uh, the future prospects are very bright. Unless the electric vehicle industry becomes commercially viable, the big numbers will not be coming. So we are ready. We're actually uh, starting a program wherein we will be taking some of our franchises to if, uh, our electric uh, factory and then train them on electric vehicles. Right? So... And also we are uh, tying up with uh, 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 another company within our mo mobility services sector to ensure that their vehicles, which are majorly electric, will get serviced at our service centers, metros. Yeah, I think there can be a lot of value addition. Even charging infrastructure can come to your, your stations. Uh, this can actually bring in better throughput for, uh, for the business. Uh, I think uh, detailing can be another big opportunity, which I think is uh, has a now full industry been established and what you yeah. said, uh, direct to home service capability. So all yeah, these, yeah. is the capability of. Absolutely. And, and retrofitting for electric vehicles in future, you know, electric vehicles, once it, once it become a big success, a lot of people would be a huge population of cars, you know, I see cars, which will try to get converted into electric vehicles though so that, that. Retrofitment also, I think, is going to be a huge opportunity for us, especially the footprint. Absolutely. What happened in CNG, you know, people converted from this to CNG. It was a big opportunity, but this right. is more complex and it will not be done by the, the old conventional way. It's a very, very complex uh, shift of uh, engineering. So, Ashta, uh, your questions for them? Yeah. So, uh, there are a lot of questions, uh, you know, which, is, which are pouring in. So, I'll just pick up a couple of them uh, from there. Is that, uh, you know, is there anything uh, that you do for um, tier two and tier three cities in specific in comparison to metros to uh, give them a little more support? Uh, what do we do specially for them? One thing is that spare parts. The spare parts supply system is quite strong in uh, metros. In fact, retailers, distributors are very, very strong there. Whereas the moment you go beyond 100 kilometers from a metro, the supply chain becomes pretty weak. That is where we have established uh, close to 30 hubs, which are basically the warehouses where we do the procurement of parts and keep them in sufficient quantities to supply to the franchises across the country. So that, you know, any uh, uh, franchisee, is located within, I would say, 200 kilometers radius of that particular hub. And, uh, and these hubs also, uh, we actually provide the spare parts right to their doorstep free of cost. So that, that's a huge value for them. And secondly, uh, here you need to do a lot of uh, business development activities, just slightly different from what we do in metro, metro cities. You know? Uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, close contact activities have to be done. You know to go and and reach out to customers to to get them uh, come to you because they're not present in newer town. You are you are covering actually 30, 40 towns within your vicinity. So those are the kind of uh, specialized uh, programs that we do for that. Sure, sure. And do you support them in any way uh, with respect to marketing, uh, which is local in nature? 
Yeah, true. We, 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 uh, it's a shared cost. Marketing cost generally, the business development cost, uh, some part of it is shared by the franchisee and it is shared by us, especially the sharing is higher in the initial period, in the first one year or two years, and later on it gradually drops on as it becomes more and more independent. Sure. Add on that, we will be wrong if you don't pick up your mind in terms of, uh, you know, what has you seen in the last, uh, say, 10 years or in the profile of franchising. So what, what, has, what has worked for some profile and what has not worked for it and, and specifically for your business, what kind of profile do you think the franchisees have to come and, and they fit the best? And, uh, and maybe some advice which you would have for potential franchisees once you get into business and wants to partner with established brands like yeah so the one profile uh, which we discussed earlier also which has really worked for us is the guy he need not be having uh, automotive experience he need not have a business experience also but he should have passion for the business he should be willing to spend time uh, and give uh, time and resources to this business. The guy who's focused generally does very, very well. We have, as per our business plan with the franchises, it takes about a year, year and a half for him to break even, you know? But there are cases where the entrepreneur is so passionate and he has maintained very good relationship with the employees as well as the customers, he was able to break even within six months. So, it is all, uh, 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 it, it all comes down to how much you're focused and how much service oriented you are, how well you are able to maintain relations with your customers and your employees. See, taking care of your employees also is a very, very important aspect. You cannot treat your employees like dirt and expect the customer satisfaction to be very, very high. So this is a crucial aspect which you've seen. Whoever have uh, you know, taken care of their employees well, tended to actually do well as well. Okay, and also the investor types who would, would like to actually put money and then later on make, uh, let it run by others or uh, some of the close relative, that actual, actually has not worked much also. And uh, one more uh, parameter just keeping in my mind is that yeah, the guy who, who spends lavishly on infrastructure, you know, typically we advise all of them, please don't spend too much on capital, right? You need to spend money and uh, on the working capital, initial funding uh, of the losses and funding of your spare parts, you know, in a very efficient manner. That is where we should be focusing on. If you spend too much money in the initial period, your return expectations also will be high and you will also get into problems faster. So those guys who are uh, prudent fiscally, they also tend to do quite well. Very good advice. I think it's always uh, good to have optimized uh, capex. So you should not. Um, this is not a home you're building. This is a business which has to create a return, and you need to sweat out every single dollar you invest on your business. So one has to optimize uh, your capex and also optimize your opex. Uh, while you need to have working capital for passing the gestation. And one of the problem I saw, and which is why I would like uh, to comment on, is that whenever people wanted to be an operator, they sometimes lack capital. You know, so we, we always saw the conflict between these investors, but the investors have money, but they don't want to put time. And people who want to put time, who are hands-on, they can go behind the counter, meet the clients, meet the uh, consumers, didn't have capital. So this was a yeah. big fight in India. And now with their two-wheeler model, they've actually brought the capex so down so that this can be an absolutely great idea in today's time uh, for a lot of entrepreneurs. I know at this stage, this is because of this job losses and other things going on. People want to have their financial freedom in their control. They need to be more in control. So I think the two-wheeler franchise, if you can just talk a little bit on that, why you created that, why you saw an opportunity in that and how it can empower uh, thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs across India who can benefit from this program. Absolutely, absolutely. There's one particular profile we were interested in very highly initially also, the service professional at the OEMs or at the dealerships. These are the guys who are ideal for us because they have the experience, they know the processes, they know how to handle the customers. And on top of that, 
they they they're not investor kind of people so if we could provide support to them financially and ensure that the capital requirement comes down drastically we were very sure that this would really take off so we created two two formats one is of course within the two wheeler uh, four wheeler itself we created this express format where the capital requirement comes down from close to a crore to about 20 25 lakhs so that actually makes uh the job of getting into this easier for this service professional the typical service professional right and we with two wheeler it has been made even easier because two wheeler probably 15 lakhs is the, uh, the money that you need to actually spend and part of that actually it can be taken as a loan also and the other thing that we have realized with two wheeler is that the scale is tremendous we're talking about you know car power which is like probably uh, you know Seven to eight times that of four wheeler, and the sales on a yearly basis also is multiple times that of four wheeler, correct? And uh, the two wheeler customer also moves out of OEM very very fast. Within one year, he is out. So that is uh, another area where uh, if you can actually turn around the vehicles faster, the ticket size could be lower, but the number of workshops in a typical city can be very high with this that means you can actually share the operating costs like marketing business development costs across large number of workshops so this makes a huge sense so that's why we entered and we just started about a year and a half two years back and we have seen tremendous response so far and post covid 19 situation as you rightly put uh, the lots of job losses there are lots of people who are actually going back to their native place and would not like to come back to the big cities and for those guys it will be an ideal situation because we are quite strong in remote areas of the country and we are also quite strong in both four wheeler as well as two wheeler for them it will be a great opportunity and it will be a great honor for them actually to be associated with them absolutely and i i looked at the model and i personally very impressed on that model it can empower a uh, thousand to thousand of entrepreneurs le- needs a very small infrastructure low rental a very big sustainability in the business model and you can start with a little low investment but you need to be an operator you need to be taking uh, uh, control of your business run day to day and manage a little bit of team around you and uh, and if you are able to do that then this business is great ashita over to you you are mute ashita yeah sorry so there are another uh, a couple of questions that people are wanting to ask that uh, do we get preference in terms of uh, servicing mahindra cars ha <laughs> <laughs> uh see having a brand name of mahindra is both an advantage and a disadvantage it is an advantage because mahindra brand is the name is there no mahindra vehicles tend to come to us little more but not too much mm-hmm. mahindra market share is about 12 to 13% in vehicle population today and in terms of number of vehicles number of job cards we get maybe 15 16% not more initially it could be high so when you start a workshop a lot of people tend to think this is mahindra workshop and then slowly they realize actually it is a multi brand workshop right mm-hmm. after that other brands also start coming in and a natural uh um, share of the population the same thing is applied here also so maruti vehicles come to us maximum and uh, mahindra follows that actual share plus maybe 3 4% extra but in terms of value it will be higher because these are bigger vehicles and uh, the ticket sizes tend to be higher so in terms of value it could be 20 25% yeah but of course our support in terms of spare parts and others will be excellent there definitely but we are not dependent only on mahindra we are actually able to attract all the other cars as well to to our fold sure so does that really attract uh, the commercial as well as uh, the luxury vehicles also as a booking so luxury vehicles also tend to come to us but right now we've been focusing on the cars that um, that are up to about 15 to 20 lakh right we're not going beyond that we don't want to be everything to everyone so as and when we make an entry into the luxury segment it will be on a planned way and it's a different uh, strategy so luxury vehicles are a little uh, out of focus right now 
but uh, all the other brands especially you know uh, difficult to get spare parts brands also are high priority for us and what is happening on the because mahindra has a big big focus on becoming a global automobile player and what is the first choice uh, focus i mean are these international on agenda because i personally feel uh, markets which would be like bangladesh sri lanka and other places and even so and that southeast asia africa north africa uh, gcc has a huge huge market for a brand like yours is is uh, 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 your brand considering going international and is there is there a plan in market because i personally feel that india has a huge opportunity and on honestly on franchise side, india side we always encourage why we do not build indian brands which are going global why we continue to bring in uh, global brands to india yeah very true there is huge potential no doubt about it it is definitely on the agenda also but not in the near future because see our market share is all branded organized service chains put together just for person we need to take this to 20 25% 30% in developed world organized service chains hold one third share one third is held by oems and one third is held by the independent garages there also so we need to fill this gap wherein we'll be extremely busy right so we don't want to defocus and do things other than this at this moment but 3 years 4 years down the line i definitely see a possibility and it will be of high interest also for us to go there on the other hand we have private label branded spare parts so these are branded generics things like you know oil which is consumable uh, basically high volume consumables these are the ones where we have developed uh, our own mfc labeled parts and this is what we are supplying to our franchises and we're also having a parallel uh, distribution and retail channel as well so we supply to distributors appointed distributors they supply to the retailers in terms they in turn they supply to the independent mechanics so that is where probably we will go international you know little earlier and uh, there have been uh, some calls from from uh, african countries from gulf also to start our brand over there or at least do a given master franchising it is definitely a big opportunity but they the, we are so tied up with uh, the fervent growth the feverish growth that is happening here we want to actually win at home majorly and then expand into other areas very helpful yeah that's interesting so uh, mr kumar can this time uh, you know uh, by are you talking about your business that you really passionate about uh, you know your business and i'm sure uh, you know it would uh, really go high uh, in terms of numbers but i really want to uh, look at it from the other side also past 100 days uh, what mr kumar apart from mindra personal services has been doing helping wife a lot <laughs> sharing household chores getting a glimpse of what a retired life could be especially uh, if, if you are living in remote areas where you know household may not be available those kind of things at the same time you know uh, it has given us time to introspect and then reset priorities you know uh we quickly realize that you no know, whatever material thing that are lying around maybe about 20% are actually needed 80% are simply not needed even after removing all the clutter right for example clothes what kind of clothes we have what kind of shoes we are not wearing shoes at all forget you know uh, uh, formal shoes even sports shoes nothing going to want so to lead but in spite of all this we can actually lead a happy life if your relationships are good that is extremely important you know finally it all comes down to that if you have harmony at home harmony with your with your friends and near and dear ones that is the life you can actually enjoy without having this artificial uh, meaning of success you know that i have to have a flashy car or to have a flashy house you know i need to be part of a big club membership and all the those things are not required so it is not that those things are going to go out of fashion once we get back all those things are going to matter to us because we cannot be we we not came in right we not be stuck in our homes but at the same time this 
should be of higher priority for us. Maintain good relationships and develop a hobby, which, uh, you know, for very, very long, I tried to uh, develop meditation. I could not. I always thought, you know, it's, it's too busy. Whenever I tried to do it for five, ten times, I could not sit for long periods. My wife is a yoga teacher. She takes yoga teach classes online. Earlier, I was not joining. So since I have nothing to do, especially she gets up in the morning, seven to eight, there's no way you can sleep. You have to get up. So I also participated in that. And immediately after that, I started practicing meditation. It has brought huge change. You know, now I will, I'm able to sit for 30 minutes, you know, mm. continuously, which is, which is good. It actually improves your focus. You'll get the focus, the kind of focus you had when you were a child back with meditation, you know, and there are other things also, like some people like singing. They have taken to singing in a passionate way. You know, they have getting a lot of recordings on Smule app, which has become very famous. And they're sending it to us to listen to it. And then on the you can, in, you can, YouTube is so popular. You can actually learn dancing on your own. Anything, whatever you wanted to do. Somebody wanted to actually become a movie director. So start making small films, start, start making small videos at home and then develop a script. All these things are possible. And another realization that has come to us is that, you know, even when we go to office, we actually um, take most of the decisions during meetings. That means when we are interacting with people and interaction with people need not be physical face to face. It can be through the computer also. The meeting, we have all realized that, you know, working from home, can be sometimes probably more productive than sitting in a meeting and discussing and other things. Of course, going to an office, socially interacting with each other and having that, you know, water cooler chit chat also is extremely important. Socially, you need to have that kind of uh, outlets also. But the productivity, we have understood a little more of how we deliver productivity at our office and how we're able to do the same thing at home quickly finish a meeting in between, do something else, which is not related to office and come back for a meeting, but also spend maybe half an hour on your own where you need to do thinking and need to do working on your own. That also is possible. So all these things are giving us new, you know, perspectives into to personal and professional life. Absolutely. And uh, I like, uh, I, I should also try some meditation. I think I've been also thinking on doing it, but uh, maybe, uh, that's a good advice and uh, you're right i think this is a new change or new normal for all of us and and this has taught us uh, how to balance our lives and uh, for everybody and, and for many many years we were just repeating ourselves and uh, we, we probably are forced uh, to get into and start thinking that what was the ideal to do and why we needed all that what we were doing and i think we will be more wiser than all of us uh, going back to the, the normal again so I start final remarks from your side and Mr. Vijay, we would like to hear if any message you want to give because Franchise India has a huge community of entrepreneurs uh, uh, across. So if any message you want to give to all the entrepreneurs out there, especially in looking at these times, what is, what is your advice to them? Sure. Ashta, you're starting with you and then I will take. Yes. So I think it's a, um, you know, it's a, Every business, I understand every entrepreneur who takes up an opportunity, there are risks and opportunity available at the same time. Uh, so every entrepreneur uh, has to mitigate risk at the maximum, but hearing the opportunity, I feel, uh, you know, Mahindra has a group, has already done a lot of things to help entrepreneurs to live up to their dreams, uh, uh, you know, uh, in these uh, situations also. And I think it was a brilliant understanding and learning about the automotive service industry as well. And um, look forward to, uh, you know, having that uh, at a different level. And I uh, feel that a few things that you're doing for franchisees are wonderful, which is like a cashless insurance or a working capital or association with banks. I think that's something which really helps uh, an entrepreneur who does business either for the first time or is doing anything else. But it really helps him transform and be profitable business sooner than what he expects to. Uh, thank you once again for having me here. Uh, to the franchise 
uh, franchisee community in general and the, and, the, uh, and the prospective franchisees who are out there. My only advice would be that, you know, before accepting any franchise, please um, don't fall for the glitzy presentations or perceived brand value. Actually get on the ground, talk to consumers, talk to customers, talk to fellow franchisees and evaluate for yourself what kind of support and the value proposition the brand is giving to what extent what they are saying is accurate, right? Understand those things and then put in your money and your passion and your resources fully, you will be successful. Franchise business will definitely be much more, uh, 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 I would say, successful and little less risky also compared to an independent business because of obvious advantages, an established business model, which is there, established uh, value proposition, which is there, and shared operating costs are there, and also shared costs of you know, procuring materials and uh, parts, something like that. So all those things are huge advantages. And the post COVID-19, I'm also saying that, you know, the, the tendency will be more towards essential services rather than discernible or luxury kind of services. For example, in our case, we have come back very quickly. We started opening from uh, 15th of May and today we are at 90% workshops are all operational across the country. Probably in a couple of days we'll reach 100%. And activity level has already reached 70% of what a, a normal month would be. And so that means we are coming back very, very fast because it is an essential service. You cannot have a vehicle which cannot run, you know, and moving around all said and done, even in this situation is, is quite essential. In fact, I was, I was reading a Stephen King novel some time back. There, due to a pandemic, much bigger calamity like this, only a few people were left in the world. So which professions were the most valued at that time? There were only two. One was doctors. Doctors, you know, you fall sick, you need doctors, whether you have, you know, 10 billion people or just a few lakhs of people. And, and the second one, are the engineers, especially the maintenance engineers. They have to ensure that things are up and running. You know, even a doctor will not be helpful if there is no ventilator which is working well, right? So that way, falls under the essential service. So you can safely uh, invest in this particular franchising with a pretty strong brand like this and you will actually do very, very well uh, pre-COVID, COVID or post-COVID. So that is just the message I would like to give. Thank you very much for having me once again. It's been a great pleasure talking to all of you, Ashta, Gauro, and all the all the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vijay. It's always a delight to have you, and uh, we enjoy a great partnership with with the brand and 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 I think your contribution both in terms of uh, the company and the industry, and more importantly towards your franchisees is very very valuable. And uh, I am sure our audience must have gained a lot from understanding from you. Thank you very much for making time for coming on the forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Kumar. Thank you, uh, uh, for being here. And uh, to all the visitors, you can follow us uh, on all the social media handles uh, which are available in front of you currently. And uh, in case you have any more questions or anything, you can always reach out to us or write to me at CEO at I'll be very happy to answer all your queries. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I look forward to having you in our next dialogue next Wednesday at 11 a.m. Thank you, everyone.